Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Schaefer's Market Mashup. It is Wednesday, September 21st, a few hours before Jerome Powell ends the world with a apocalyptic 200 basis point interest rate hike. <laughs> nope, just kidding. Um, just a normal Fed day, hopefully. Maybe we'll get into that later. Uh, my guest today is Seth Golden, Chief Market Strategist at Phenom Group. Um, this might be Seth's first time on the pod, but if the name rings a bell and the Twitter handle, uh, Seth CL, uh, it's because our Twitter accounts have a little bit of a bromance going on. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We've been constantly sharing and hat tipping our, our, our content. It's Kobe Shack, it's uh, Brady Moss, it, you pick whatever analogy you want, but it's only right we take this to the next level with a podcast team up. So Seth, it's great to finally have you on. No, it's great to be on. Thank you. You guys put out great, great work, great content. And uh, a lot of it tickles my fancy in the sense that uh, it's a lot of quantitative data that I can appreciate helps uh, me to, you know, kind of flesh out any emotional nonsense that, you know, uh, traders might be dealing with. You just get to the heart of the matter. This is what, you know, the data says historically, you know, regardless of the headline. So I always appreciate, uh, you know, what you guys put out there at Schaefer's. Yeah, straight to the point. That's what we're, we're aiming for. So with new guests, I like to start with how they wound up where they are. Point to three inflection points in your life that got to where you are today. Okay, just three. <laughs> yeah, just three. Um, uh, I would have to say first one being education, just uh, graduating from uh, getting my, my bachelor's degree. I got my, orig- my first degree in uh, English education. I uh, started teaching, unfortunately, uh, lost my father at a, at a young age, which kind of ushered me out of teaching due to uh, newfound parental responsibilities of younger siblings <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and just having to take on that load. Um, I did. I worked in retail after that and for most, most of my collegiate career. Uh, I went back into retail once I kind of had the family, the home front settled, if you will. Uh, and I worked at uh, Target for uh, almost no, not quite a decade um, and just learned a lot about uh, the consumer, the world, the macro fundamentals that are involved with you know, retailing that maybe a lot of folks that don't get that hands-on um, approach, you know, they, they don't quite appreciate it as much. So I would say that was a big stepping stone for me. Um, but then I also went back to school and um, you know, was doing business and economics. Um, I've always had a great uh, appreciation for the financial markets, which is why I kind of went, you know, back to school uh, to get that degree. And, um, you know, I was in, I've been investing all my life. So since uh, 1999, I think I took my first trade in 2000 with a Scott trade platform for those of you who recall the Scott trade platform. And um, uh, eventually started my own firm, a uh, boutique research firm, uh, selling uh, white papers and um, stock-specific research uh, to Wall Street as well as uh, hedge fund institutions. And um, yeah, I, I would say most pivotal points in my life were education, work experience, um, and most importantly, just uh, my walk with Christ, finding, finding uh, you know, my spiritual center in this world, so... Yeah, you know, I always loved talking with someone who, yes, you had the financial interest and inspiration, but you, you starting off as an English major, you know, coming from someone who's a liberal arts person, I I, I always appreciate that, and it, it it's always a reminder that there you you can find your way into this world almost indirectly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I I, I like to say I've got three degrees. I've not used a one. <laughs> You know, I've not used a one really. I mean, I might have gotten a job because of having the degree, but in the field, I've not really used it. Um, you know, working for you know a major institution that hired me for an MBA, mm-hmm. you know, or uh, I, I did work for 
you know, about a year as uh, an English teacher in high school. But again, you know, so three degrees, one year of work experience in, in, in the field. Yeah, let's see. I was a minor in international relations, and I can assure everybody I'm not a spy. I don't work in the CIA. So there, mm-hmm. there, there's one that's down right there. <laughs> uh, so stuff. we, I referenced it earlier, your, your Twitter account, and your pinned tweet right now is back from March, and you are referencing the yield curve, yield curve, sorry, yield curve inversion. Right. Uh, basically saying, I think it was 16 months before that really starts to show an impact. Right. Six months later, do you have a follow-up on that? Like wh- where, where does that stand? Yeah. I mean, usually it's, it's also, uh, I guess I, uh, you want to pair data, right? I, I don't like to look at any specific data point in a vacuum. Um, I like to have multiple data points to look at. And that particular one denoted Uh, because most people fear the inversion of the yield curve, whereas um, typically when the yield curve inverts, forward returns for the S&P 500 are still positive out three, six, and 12 months. However, that's not the case this time, as we all know. Uh, One of the things that are impacting uh, that particular data point is the rapidity of this monetary tightening cycle. And so if we look, if, if we conjoin those two, usually when the yield curve forward uh, data, so far as S&P 500 returns, proves faulty, um, or you have that standard deviation, is when you have an accelerated rate cycle, which that's what we have right now, an accelerated rate cycle. Mm -hmm. So while that data point in a vacuum is valid, it's historic, it speaks, you know, it's black and white, that's what happened throughout history. When you do pair it with the different types of rate hike cycles, uh, this is the worst one. You know, the accelerated rate hike cycle doesn't deliver the same type of returns when you do have a yield curve inversion as it would otherwise. Mm -hmm. I I was hoping you get to that because I thought that was perfect timing with the the, the Fed hammer about to drop and Mm -hmm. essentially... Here's another 75 basis points, boys and girls. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're just, they're giving them out like candies. So, and I think <laughs> yeah. that's, that needs to be underscored how, how important that is. Right. Yeah. What, what I do like about your, not only just your Twitter, but I, I, looking at Phenom is the ease of which you guys explain things in a concise, simple manner. VIX, right. volatility, futures, these are all concepts coming from, from experience as a non-finance person that they're, they're scary. They can frighten someone yeah. and they can really kind of t- keep them away from really embracing the market. How do you bridge the gap and how can just anyone in the investing world help bridge that gap between retail investors and experts? Yeah, uh, well, expert. Um, uh, experience is how I like to think about it. You know, I I don't think there's an expert out there. I think some of us have just a lot more experience and we've learned from those experiences. Um, When it comes to VIX volatility, uh, the way I try to keep it simple is a lot of people think in terms of, um, you know, they they use volatility as a hedge. Um, They're buying VIX call options, if you will, or going long uh, specific VIX exchange traded products. The way I try to uh, participate, you know, as an investor, I, I'm always thinking long term and I'm always thinking duration. As long as I have duration on my side, I have more time in the trade and or investment, then I'm doing the right thing. You know, like an old Warren Buffett quote, time is the investor's best friend. So anything I do, uh, especially volatility related, because when we think about volatility, we think about, you know, rapid swings. Um I don't want to suffer from those rapid swings, whether it's whether or not it's uh, I own an option or I'm just uh, shorting common a, a UVXY exchange traded product or a VXX exchange traded product. I want to give myself as much duration in the trade as possible because I know the one thing and the most simplistic thing about volatility is that it has no probability of persistently rising. 
it's eventually going to mean revert and ultimately mode revert. As long as those are my principal guideposts, all I need is time. The best way I can make sure I have time is to appropriately position size. So mm -hmm. I just try to keep it really simple. I don't try to create um, synthetic structured products, you know, um, to trade the volatility complex. I try to keep it really simple. And I think time and I think, you know, the, the byproduct of that would be, you know, my position size. If, yeah, I, it, if those are both right, I'll make a profit. It's just a matter of when. It, it sounds like you're turning time almost into a currency. Correct. Correct. I value that time above all else. Yeah, I, I really like that. That's, that's a good way of, of framing it. Uh, just right now, what I think is interesting is the VIX is last seen lower, I think 1.6%, even amid the uh, the Putin news of the yeah. mobilization <laughs> and the um, obviously the, the Fed stuff incoming in the next couple of hours. I found that interesting. FinTwit was kind of losing their mind that the VIX was- <laughs> yeah. He's going to press know. the button, but the VIX is down. <laughs> right, right. And I think that I don't know. I thought that was fascinating. Do you have any kind of thoughts on that? I, I, considering the regime that we've come from, you know, I, I think in terms of regimes, duration, we've come from an elevated volatility regime mm -hmm. uh, where we didn't quite know the nuances involved in 2021, let alone 2020. So we were still adapting and trying to learn on the fly. So we kept premiums bid pretty healthy last year. And the things that we're contending with this year are either all front and center. We've dealt with them in the past. We have a history for inflation. We've got a history for, you know, prices, you know, maintain um, anchored uh, inflation, if you will. So these are all things that we kind of have a playbook for. Um, and to my primary point, um, you know, we came from an elevated volatility regime. So naturally, nobody wants to continue to pay those premiums when they can see what's coming. I mean, this is this may be the what uh, most foreseeable recession on the horizon in history. Mm -hmm. um, so I think people have already greatly deleveraged their portfolios as well. Um, I've seen a lot of capitulatory action back in June. Um, so you have limited exposure, limited leverage. You know, and that's just not a good at environment for implied volatility premiums. So, do you think it's been built up too much, or? Uh, I try not to read into the narratives. Mm -hmm. You know, with financial media, if you will. Um, I try to just follow the data, stick to my disciplines. Uh, I, you know, if somebody asks me, you know, do I see a recession? Do I think, you know, things are going to get out of control? Um, I think we're not the people that we look for in times of need are the same people that we're bashing when we don't get our way, which is the Fed. Mm -hmm. You know, we we clamor for the Fed to do something when we need it. And then when they've done it, we play Monday morning quarterback mm -hmm. and, you know, club them over the head. But by and large, they're the smartest people in the room. I mean, they're you know, they're handling the fiat currency of the world and making policies centered on that fiat currency. So. I think there's just a lot of narrative that becomes hyperbole and it we resolve all these matters. I, there are a million reasons to sell and most of them are man-made and yet we seem to overcome 90% of those. Uh, could this be the 10% that you know does uh, foster some kind of calamity? It could be, but as an investor, I want to lean into the 90% probability, not the 10%. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and considering we are fresh off a 10% event, if you will, with the pandemic, it just pure yep. history says that these things are a little bit more spaced out. Yeah. these And, and what we have right now is a solvable problem with inflation. Mm -hmm. If we give it time, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, it's going to course correct itself. Yeah. I love that. Mm -hmm. So diving into some specifics. Are there any options, trends, or strategies that you see taking the spotlight as we close down 2022 and enter 2023? And in that same vein, are there any particular sectors that you're watching and keeping an eye on? Yeah, so far as options, I mean, I follow the 
put call ratio. I check it out, you know, every day to also get a better understanding of sentiment and regimes. And nobody wants call options this year. Oof, we this just, is- we just, uh, or I just wrote or edited the article of yesterday. Uh, it's the call buying ratio uh, bought to open is at its lowest since the the COVID crash in March and April. Yeah, over yeah, two nobody years. Wants them. So you know, it's just like how I think about volatility. I, that is only going to be a sustainable trend for so long, in my opinion. Um, so at some point, people are going to want to put money to work, and we're going. I think we're going to see, uh, you know, by year end, if not early in 2023, uh, a reversion to the mean, where we do get some advancing, you know, call option activity. Um, we may already have seen the peak in the put call ratio earlier this year and started a kind of downtrend. I mean, you, you knew we were going to be getting into something nasty this year based on just following the trend in the put call ratio last year. Mm-hmm. We had all we had levels last year that we haven't seen since 96 through 99. Um, and, and again, that was only going to be sustainable for so long. And I, I was constantly asked, you know, Seth, why don't you think this is going to be four years of this? You know, like it was 96 to 99 in the put call ratio. And I would say to myself, well, 31% return in 2019, 2020, we had an 18% return and 2021, we had a 24% return in the S&P 500. Well, there's your three years, you know, and what is the likelihood we were going to have double digit returns four years in a row? Again, only that dot com period. So, you know, when I saw that kind of final trough in the put call ratio last year around, uh, I think it was November, and we trended higher into the first quarter of this year, I understood we were uh, transitioning to a new regime. There was going to be more volatility. There was going to be a lack of appetite. Uh, for call options and a hefty, you know, premium for those 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 put options. So I think that'll see some reversal by year end, but got to see you know those trend lines connect, if you will. Mm-hmm. And do you think because the fall off is, has been so far so fast that that's almost a reason for there to be the bottom equally coming so far so fast? Yeah, I think so because this and markets without liquidity is as you're you know I mean. Top of book depth depth is just horrid. Every year it just seems to get worse and worse and worse since 2016. So markets move at a more expeditious manner. So I think we are, or we should. I mean, no guarantees, but we, we should you know expedite that transition as well. Um, and so far, as sectors are concerned. I, I didn't touch on that, but um, I like growth. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to make money long term. Um, I think you got to be have some aspect of your portfolio uh, centered on growth. Now you can do defensive growth, which I like, which is healthcare. And ever since I've liked it, it's done garbage for me so far. But that's the way it goes. You know, if I'm going to get if I get into something because I have a thesis um, and it goes against me, well, did anything change in the fundamentals? If the answer is no, then I'm getting better value. Mm-hmm. And so I'll increase my exposure according to a plan. Very important there for listeners. He's checking the fundamentals. He's not just buying. He's he's you know cracking open the tape and looking and seeing what's going on. That's that's the most important part when you're faced with a drawdown like this. Is is you know, are you getting a di- yeah, like you said, are you getting a discount or is it time to cut bait? Yeah. All right. Well, as we start to wrap up here, uh, I, I do want to give the floor to you. Well, I mean, shit, the floor has been yours the whole time. But uh, <laughs> appreciate it. Yeah, tell everyone that's listening what's going on at Phenom. Where can listeners find your work online? Anywhere? Just yeah. Tell me what's going um, on. So, got a pretty you know public profile on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at Seth C L. Um, phenomgroup.com, F-I-N-O-M, uh, group.com. And what we do at Phenom Group is uh, macro market research. Every week we have a uh, weekend macro market research report, top 
top down uh, with uh, fundamentals, quantitative data, and technical analysis. We you know, really tried to preach the three disciplines of investing. Um, in fact, you'll all, well, our, our members will often find a Schaefer's uh, data point in there on a weekly basis. Mm-hmm. Um, and every week we do a, uh, like this, a podcast, I call it the state of the market. It kind of gives you an intra week, you know, on the fly, some really key charts, some key data points, uh, just to keep you grounded in, in what's going on with the price action, because there's only one thing that pays and that's price. Um, we have a really good community uh, at Phenom Group. Every you know thing from novice traders to because um, we white paper as well. So mm-hmm. we have some institutions and hedge funds that participate in our uh, live daily trading room. So you have a, a trading room that's moderated uh, by myself, and we basically watch educational videos. We're doing trades, uh, investment ideas in the trading room, things of that sort. So it's very interactive has a social feel to it. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, hard, uh, hard research on a weekly basis, uh, multiple tiers, you know, if you just want the the research, uh, it's $9.99 a month. Uh, if you want all the frills, if you will, I think it's a uh, $59.99 a month. So yeah, just a quick look over the site, you know, the socials, there's the 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 lovely mix and there's not enough of this on Fintwit, I think, of you're having fun, but you're also backing it up with data. Yeah. Yeah. It's, there's no there's no snuffiness. There's it's lighthearted and conversational, but at the same time, here's the numbers, here's the data. And that's yeah. I think that's why we just kind of keep coming back to you guys because it's it's exactly the message that we want to deliver. Absolutely appreciate it. Thank you for time here on the podcast today. Yeah, no problem. So uh, last question, because uh, I'm more of a South Carolina guy. Where is Ocala, Florida? Um, Orlando, Florida. I'm sure oh. you're familiar. Yeah. Uh, so we're about 45 minutes north of Orlando, about an hour and a half south of Jacksonville. Okay. It's, um, it's literally the horse capital of the world. Like all those horses that you see in the Belmont Stakes and the Preakness and the Kentucky Derby, at some point in time, I would say 90% of those horses have come through. Either they've been bred here, they're being trained here, maybe they were breeded here, but that's Ocala. You know? Okay, it's the interesting. Capital of the world. Yeah. I, you know what? I, I'm embarrassed to say I went to school in Kentucky I uh, ha- I have lots of friends that are very horse adjacent. I've got bourbon behind me. No, wait, well, hold on. I even see that. <laughs> I've got a painting. It's got some bourbon behind me. Kentucky bourbon. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, then I guess we have to ask then. What's your favorite? Um, I'm not I'm not really a drinker. You know, you have to ask okay. my wife. Okay. Uh, you know, just kind of my my. Uh, hey, it's, yeah, it's spiritual. a great looking. It's a great looking picture. But no, I I, I had no idea about Ocala. I didn't know that they yeah. were that plugged in. John Travolta lives here. He's got a home oh, here cool. and his own air base. You know, it's it's really interesting. You can see his his home from the uh, the horse horse pasture, horse fields, and whatnot. Um, Calvin Klein has wow. his own ranch here. The former CEO of Campbell's has her own horse farm or horse ranch here. A lot of big names, but if you blink, you know, on you're on I-75. If you blink, you're past Ocala in about three minutes. So. Well, that's cool. That's cool, though. I like that small town mix. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll be up in or I'll be going down to Keeneland probably here in a couple of weeks. So oh, okay. I'll, I'll have to uh, we'll have to reach out to you about that. Absolutely. absolutely. So. All right, Thank Seth Golden. Again. Thanks again for coming on. Hopefully this is the first of many episodes. I'll put the link to everything he's got on this episode's bio, as well as the link to our playbook of the week. And yeah, have a good one. Thank you.